turn to that first. I'm going to turn it over to, to Representative Donahue uh, first to walk us through some issues around some language that has to do with, uh, has to do with mental health. And Commissioner Wilson. Uh, and then when, after, and I think we should still, I think my sense is we should probably be able to move fairly quickly through some of this. And then, uh, and then we'll transition without a break to some further conversation. We had some briefing last night, or yesterday, briefly, uh, about healthcare affordability issues. Uh, and if we need a break in there to do anything else, we'll do that. Uh, then we will have a break and we'll shift gears to a different topic. Yeah. Hey, great. Um, we talked about, I mean, there are three specific areas, pieces of language. Um, the one we're starting with, I don't think anybody actually saw, has seen actual language, although we've talked about the concept. Um, when DMH presented on the 10-year uh, vision plan, um, uh, the commissioner said there was one legislative ask in terms of uh, follow-up, not that there isn't a lot of follow-up that the department's doing, but in terms of legislation. And that was the recognition that DMH and, and, and the vision can say all sorts of things, um, but if the whole health system isn't involved and in buying in, um, then we're not going to achieve integration, because it's integration in with a lot of other stuff. Um, so this is the language that would establish that council, um, which has a lot of membership, um, because it's really about getting um, all those other parts of the system on board. Um, so we can walk through the language. I would actually suggest that we first go to the purposes of what the group does, because that will help make it more clear why there's um, all of the representation uh, that there is. Um, and I, I know there, there was one person who reacted, uh, uh, one of the members uh, of the Techno Council, who said, well, our one reaction is there, there's, it's too heavily on the medical system people and not enough mental health representatives. And I said, well, actually, that's the whole point <laughs> of this. The mental health folks came up with a plan, and now this is about carrying it forth by engaging the rest of the mental health system. Um, so um, you're able to scroll, or, or David? Oh, you, we're already scrolled up. I pulled okay. up to that section. Yeah. Great, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. All right, so if folks look at the um, where it begins after the list, uh, powers and duties. And this is really the core. This is why this council is being established. Um, so it's addressing integration. <coughs> At the very beginning, it talked about um, our statutory requirement for integration and the vision plan. But these are the very specific things that would be the, the council's responsibility. First, identifying I'm, I'm options. I'm sorry, and I, am, I have no idea where we are. Oh, I'm sorry, because no, I'm okay. looking here. So you're, it's on the one that says on the top, uh, oh, powers and duties. Okay, okay. I got okay. it. Thank you. Guys. I'm sorry. Is it, um, is it what's up here? Yeah. I'm just, I can't see okay. that. So, okay. the powers and duties, the council <laughs> shall address the integration of mental health in the health care system, including, and then there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Six duties. Yeah. Okay. So, the first one is to identify obstacles. Um, in other words, in all of the parts of the system that each of these people represent, where are their obstacles to achieving the goals that have been set out, both in legislation previously and through the vision plan? Second, helping to ensure implementation of those existing laws that require integration um, within the members' expertise in the council. So um, different groups representing different parts of the system. Uh, if we scroll up a little, we can see three. And establishing commitments from all of those non-state entities to adopt the practices and implementation tools for integration. Again, that's referencing back to the beginning where we talked about the vision plan and the legislative mandate. Fourth, the council can propose legislation um, if our current statute isn't inadequ is inadequate to achieve it or creates barriers. Um, and then fifth, the routine language on any other duties it deems necessary. Um, it will then report uh, back um, in, uh, oops, I've got a scroll here. Um, 
uh, in 2023. So that's, we're giving, this is a two-year council to work on this, so report back with recommendations, uh, including whether there's any recommended legislative actions and whether they need to be extended. The assumption is it's two years, it's not an ongoing forever group, but it's two years to identify and um, put together um, how we're gonna achieve this. Um, so now if we go back to the start, we can look through um, the membership. Um, I have sent out contact to everyone who's been asked to be a member, uh, basically saying, if you don't think you belong on this council, speak up. <laughs> Nobody has said they think they don't belong. Um, I've, gotten, I've gotten a number of people saying uh, yes, you know, um, but um, nobody has said, oh no, take me off, I don't want to be involved in that. So, um, but we can look through, it, 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 A through F are all commissioners within the state system, beginning mostly with AHS, but you'll see each of those um, departments in AHS, that, in AHS um, have relevance to um, integration to or towards our goal of an integrated system. Um, you know, corrections um, has a division in, in how it delivers uh, healthcare systems um, and so forth. And the F, then the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, is pretty self evident why um, they're important to be a part. Um, we then have uh, both the Green Mountain Care Board and the Secretary of Education. Um, and after that, it begins more the, the uh, community-wide stakeholders, um, which includes the Medical Society, the Hospitals S Association, Vermont Care Partners, which are the, the designated agencies, um, the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. That's somebody we haven't actually, I don't know if some of the new members have met Peter uh, Espen J. Yeah. Um, who is the executive director of that uh, group. Um, the uh, bi-state primary care, um, important aspect of primary care delivery. Um, representative from the University of Vermont Medical School. And that's really important. Uh, this was some of what the um, task, not task force, what think tank made recommendations about when we're talking about um, sort of the unconscious bias of the system, if you will, that right in medical school that needs to begin to be addressed and we need that commitment uh, from the medical school. Uh, One care, the health care advocate, the mental health care advocate, um, represent representation from the insurance industry. And just to clarify, the council is getting pretty large. Often we, you know, there isn't, a, there isn't a group that represents all of the private insurers. They each speak for themselves. Um, but um, it didn't really seem rational in terms of expanding the council to have both Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP representative. I spoke with them. Um, about that issue, and MVP said they were completely okay and understood um, that only the largest mm -hmm. insurer, which for Vermont is Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, represent that perspective. So um, you can be assured that that's not going to create a problem. That it's um, it's just one, which in the language of art or whatever, what that's saying is Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, and uh, then. Um, in terms of direct stakeholders to keep that voice at the table. Um, two people who have received services, one of them being a somebody who delivers peer services. So that's the peer workforce representation. Um, and then family members, um, there are two also there because one is family of people who receive services, but the other is a family member who has a child uh, who receives services. Um, so that's the list. Um, I think there's been some cross discussions around trying to make it inclusive. Um, and that's really the core of the bill. There is language at the end that is the routine, um, you know, the Department of Mental Health chairs, the Department of Health co-chairs, I mentioned the reports. Uh, there are directives around um, meetings, um, and that is meeting at least 
bi-monthly um, ceases to exist uh, July 30th, 2023. Uh, we routinely have councils exist beyond uh, when their final report is because we may need them to come in and tell us what's in their report and so forth. Um, and um, uh, reimbursement is under our statute, which basically means people who are not getting paid by their job position for their activities mm -hmm. um, are eligible for a stipend. Uh, so uh, if we could now have our witness uh, sure. comment and maybe answer questions. Yes, of course. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning. For the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. I uh, want to thank Vice Chair Donahue for her leadership on this um, in terms of thinking about the council. Um, from my perspective, as this committee is aware, the Department of Mental Health really leaned into our charge in terms of articulating a 10-year plan uh, for a future of uh, integration of mental health within the broader health care system um, that I think will benefit uh, generations of Vermonters to come. One of our very specific asks of the legislature uh, was to form this council. Uh, we have several other action areas that we are able to implement within our existing authority and resources that we, of course, are working on. Um, but when we think about, as I said before, the 10-year plan um, wasn't the end, it was just the beginning. And we really want to create conditions for change. Um, I really feel that what we have articulated as a state system, as systems partners, uh, really has the opportunity to be transformational. Um, when we think about implementation, as someone who's been steeped in implementation science, um, we really need a council, a table that is set with high-level leaders across mental health and our health care system if we really want to move things forward um, and actually operationalize um, some of the incredible opportunities that we have around integration. Um, so the Department of Mental Health fully supports um, the representation um, that's been articulated here. I think um, from a facilitation standpoint, we're always trying to manage inclusivity and representation um, with a body that is manageable and that we can really move work forward in a reasonable way. I feel very confident that given the scope of the council as it's currently been presented, um, that we can be very effective. Um, it is proposed to be chaired um, by the Commissioner of Mental Health, working in collaboration with the Department of Health. Um, I think that's the right way to approach it um, because really we can really continue our leadership on the 10-year plan and our vision for integration. Um, I think that the council itself um, can hold the vision of integration under the tent of the council, uh, which is, I think, significant as we look to move this forward. Um, it also creates an accountability structure that we need. Um, it provides structure so that we can create um, decision making. Um, as the vice chair noted, uh, we have some significant areas um, that are actually already statutorily in law, um, but maybe not being fully implemented. Um, so we need the folks, right folks around the table to help us do that. A good example of that is payment parity um, in terms of equal rates of payment for the same services when provided by mental health professionals as compared to physical health professionals to ensure that folks can access uh, those services equitably. Um, I also think there is an opportunity as we look to implement um, the 10-year plan that the council creates an accountability infrastructure to oversee that implementation um, as we move forward. Um, so those are my high-level comments. Um, again, the department supports what's been um, presented, um, and we're looking forward to this as the next step to advance our statewide work around integration. Great. Can we, if we could just scroll back to sure. the very beginning, because one question that had already come back is, you know, are we starting over on trying to identify what does it mean to integrate? And I think the introductory language helps makes clear that this is about ensuring that everybody participates in the <coughs> principles that are already in statute and as envisioned by the plan that's been developed. So this is not to start reworking a plan. This is to involve everyone else in making it happen. That's a great point. We have put a lot of time and energy over the past year in terms of articulating what our end state is, what those short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies are. The council is a vehicle to advance that work, not to start over. <laughs> so any uh, questions? We have a lot of commissioners here, and then I see or designate. 
do you expect all your commissioners to participate in the membership of this board, or do you expect it perhaps will be passed off to um, somebody at a lower grade? I, I think it will depend. Um, I think there are commissioners, Some we share, having talked to some of the other commissioners um, that really want a seat at the table. Uh, for some commissioners that I think oversee large departments, um, sometimes it's actually beneficial to delegate um, to someone whose particular purview might be a little closer um, to the provision of mental health services and integrating that broader in the health care system. Um, Department for Children and Families is an example of that. It's so big, um, it could be more beneficial um, to have someone who is more directly overseeing that specific area. I think um, another good example is the Department of Corrections. Yes. Um, they have a medical director. Mm -hmm. That person probably would be better suited than the commissions correct, uh, the Corrections Commission. If, if I could say, just as a general uh, observation, this is the type of language that is almost always used uh, when trying to involve, this is not unique to this council, uh, whenever trying to involve a department or an agency, uh, it says, it names the commissioner or secretary or designee so that they have the authority then to uh, uh, find the right person to represent them on any, so that this is, this is not unique language, this is kind of boilerplate language to facilitate right person being at the table. That's correct. Right. Yeah, could, could you scroll back up to the top? Sure. Uh, I, I was reading the first paragraph which says the purpose of it, helping to ensure that all sectors of the healthcare system actively participate in the state's principle. You mean, are you saying there are people that don't participate that should right now? I am saying that we are moving towards articulating a vision for integration, um, and in order to achieve that, I think there is a lot of commitment um, to the vision as it currently stands. The next step is to take that more action, make that more actionable. Um, I think our healthcare partners, which was clearly operationalized in the think tank, really came to the table, um, and now we need to take it that one step further. How long has this been a concern? Mm -hmm. uh, 30 years <laughs> or longer. Or longer. I'll speak to that. I, yeah. Think, yeah. I, I think, I think what, 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 and I, and I, and I credit uh, Representative Donahue and this committee mm -hmm. for really, and, and the speaker, quite mm -hmm. honestly, mm -hmm. in saying, uh, in moving responsibility for mental health from the Human Services Committee to this committee, the Health Care Committee, uh, as a structural statement. That mental health and health, mental health is a part of health care. Historically, is historically mental health has often been siloed off to the side, yep. uh, both because of sometimes issues of stigma and sometimes issues of disparate funding, different kinds of funding. Like, well, we have health care here, and maybe we'll do something with mental health. And I think there's a recognition sure. that mental health is an essential component of health and health care. And so that's uh, so I think. In many, in many ways, this, this is a reflection of an historic mm -hmm. uh, reintegration of the acknowledgement of mental health as an essential element of health care. And, and this is a recognition that we're not there yet. Yeah, and that, that there's more work to be done. Yeah. So if you could scroll down to the bottom then, uh, there's a date somewhere there that I saw two years ago. January 15, 2023. Uh, and you probably will still be here. Uh, would you make sure that there's a follow-up on this? I sure as heck will. <laughs> so, that, so that it can be proven that that group amounted to something. If I'm not still a member of the legislature, I will be here as a mental health advocate. <laughs> well, maybe speak from the governor's office if you want. <laughs> but, thank you. Yes, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a question. The, it's admirable that it is so inclusive. It's very inclusive. Is it too big, though, and unwieldy? It's a great question. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're always trying to balance inclusion and representation with actually facilitating a working group. Um, I think that actually um, our facilitation of the think tank was a good demonstration of our capacity um, to take a large group, such as 25 or more um, key stakeholders. Um, to really have good, solid facilitation. I think the Department of Mental Health has 
um, a deep bench of talent when it comes to facilitating large groups, and we will be the primary kind of administrative support. Um, so I think my answer is, is the group big? Yes. Can we manage it and be a productive entity? Absolutely. Um, I have a, a couple things. I guess to, to Brian Smith's point, it's something I think I've been thinking about a lot as far as creating groups and asking for reports. And I think, I guess just a proposal to the committee that I think it might be a good idea if we hold ourselves to the standard that any time we ask for a report or create a group, at least one member of the committee verbally commits, whether they're reelected or here or not, to follow through to the very end. And I, I just, this is something I've been thinking about where I, I would not ask for another report or group unless I personally was committed that I would stick with it through the end and make something come of it. And it's just a thought to flip to the committee. Um, and, then, and then my other piece, could you go to the duties? Um, yeah, I really, I really appreciated the intro part about making sure that it's, you know, the idea is not to come up with a new plan. The idea is to implement the plan that extreme work has gone into coming up with. And the only one here I wonder about is number one, if to me, if identifying obstacles to the full integration of mental health. It seems like a lot of what the vision group was doing was identifying those obstacles. So I wonder if that if there would be a way to word that something more close to identifying obstacles to the full integration of and then specifically list the statute and specifically list the 10 year vision. And so it, it's clear that the idea is not to have start at square one with a new discussion of right. what do we need in our mental health care system, but talk with these stakeholders about we know what we need and what are the obstacles to all of us getting there. I don't know, just to float that out. Yeah, I mean, that, that could work. I think because of the overarching purpose at the beginning, I think that that's um, assumed here. But it, it also, if it, was, if it was limited to kind of only identifying obstacles to achieving the vision plan, it might close off some really important pieces of um, of not changing what the vision is, but what the obstacles to achieving it might be. There might be ones that the think tank didn't, because it didn't have this broad a conclusion, uh, might not have thought about or been aware of. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's about achieving the plan and the statutory uh, obligations, which were only put in statute, I think, about four years ago in terms of those principles. Um, Identifying obstacles probably wants to stay broad enough for obstacles to achieving those things um, that might not have been in, listed in the uh, think tank plan. What about putting both, like, full integration of mental health into a holistic health care system as outlined by, and then list the statute where it says, you know, where it talks about integrate as outlined by the statute and the ten-year vision? I think that I think that'd be fine. I think that's duplicative of, of the purpose part because this is sort of just filling out the details of what was already stated um, as the as the purpose of the council okay. at the beginning. Yeah, and the only thing I might add to that is that we did very strategically use appreciative inquiry um, as a strategy to move this work forward when we look at systems change. Um, not only do we want to identify obstacles and barriers, we also want to be lifting up the current assets that we have and build on those. That actually creates motivation for the kind of transformational change that we're looking for. So my only other thought reflectively on this was to mm -hmm. capture that somehow, that we do have existing assets in the system that we can also build upon in addition to identifying identifying, you know, the barriers as well. So can we talk for a minute about the process of moving this into, moving this forward? Mm -hmm. um, there is, there was, there was discussion about having it in our miscellaneous health care bill, which we're talking about moving, which we will move by tomorrow. Uh, because it talks about per diems, initially one thought was that perhaps that would pull it into the health, into the, um, pull the whole bill into the Appropriations Committee, because anytime there's per diems, something has to go to Appropriations, and then they have to vote the bill out. It doesn't go directly to the floor. Um, I did note that the, and I'm not sure that this gets around it, but that the per diems are actually coming out of the mental health budget, so they're not additional per diems that have to be authorized by the Appropriations Committee. 
and in noting that, it seemed to me that maybe they, it wouldn't be pulled into appropriations. Um, but uh, I, I think I would like to uh, take a straw poll on the general construct or language and then be able to consult with appropriations. Because frankly, uh, I don't want the whole miscellaneous health care bill to mm -hmm. linger in appropriations if, in fact, this becomes a part of it. Then there, we might find another vehicle or even have it be freestanding so that if it, if it was required to go to appropriations, this, this alone would go there rather than all of our other elements. So rather than a, a bill number to vote or, yeah, yeah the, so the, how it, where it fits in, we and can then, And then we'll, then we'll talk, I'll, I'll discuss that further with the committee in terms of the actual vehicle for moving this forward because uh, I think there's some strategic issues uh, that we should think about in terms of the, what it might mean to have it go into appropriations as part of a larger bill that we that otherwise would not be going there. So, does that seem agreeable to folks? So with that, then uh, just take a straw poll. So I think uh, are people prepared to just uh, in general take a straw poll on the language? Like, is it? I mean, is it interpret? Uh, should it be interpreted as a straw poll on generally we like the direction or a straw no, poll straw on poll the language? language. Exactly. No, 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 I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking crossover I, I, smart. At, at this point, we need to be moving. Okay. Pieces. So where we talk, was there interest in expanding it to talk about the asset? I mean, is now the time to have the final final language? Yes. So so should we talk about if there should be a piece about in the identifying challenges also yeah. identifying the the um well, assets anything, of the anything that you wish to talk about this is the time because um, so are you making a suggestion yeah what is that well i i, I mean it sounded like the commissioner just Suggested? Do, do you want to? Say okay, yes. I, I don't that. think she was suggesting language. I think she was just talking about. Well, I don't let's ask what she was <laughs> suggesting. <laughs> that. Yeah. I think that um, I don't know that it requires a language change. Um, I think that it can be inherent, kind of linking back to Vision 2030, which is referenced in the beginning. Um, we have a lot of information about appreciative inquiry in our approach in order to engage the council to feel motivated towards change. We will be facilitating looking at obstacles and assets. So if, I don't think it's necessarily needing to be included in the language. Is that satisfactory? Yes. Yeah. Okay, other questions? We're not talking about a lot of money for this, for this bill. There's only um, a maximum of four people who would actually be eligible Most to ask people for a study. Will be already working under uh, salary positions. So I don't see why appropriations would, would have an issue with it. Well, they, they probably wouldn't ultimately, but technically, anytime there are per diems, it has to go there, and they don't deal with this until they've completed the budget. Because they have to look at the entirety of the budget. They, they set aside a pot of money for per diems, mm -hmm. and if it exceeds, and if the request for study committees and per diems exceeds that, then they, have, then they will pair it back. And so that's it's just it slows it it slows something down from moving to this moving through our process. That, that thing, right? well, is your concern the money coming out of mental health appropriations or health appropriations? Is that the concern? No. No. Then I'm then I'm missing what this straw vote is going to be about. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me maybe let me try to clarify. <clears throat> I was trying to just move us forward uh, and explain that. We were initially talking about maybe having this be part of a larger miscellaneous health care bill or alternatively having it stand alone. We could make the decision right now to just have it stand alone as a bill. We could take it to the floor as a bill. And then that would, if, if, if it goes to appropriations, so be it. Uh, if it doesn't, then our miscellaneous health care bill won't have this as part of it. If it's a standalone bill, there's not a lot of money involved in it, is there? No. It doesn't seem to be. No. 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 Very small. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm it, maybe that makes sense just to uh, take one let one thing off your agenda of people you fine, need to talk fine. to. We could just go ahead and say. So then, so then what I, the process would be of asking Jen to craft this as a committee bill. It's not in that form right now. 
but we would ask her to put it in the form of a committee bill from the House Health Care Committee, uh, which we can do, it, and have this be a standalone bill. Does that seem like that? maybe that's the most straightforward way to do At which point, then, I would suggest this, uh, that we ask her to bring that back to us as a committee bill, and we will vote on that sometime later today, rather than take any more time now. And that way, we'll have it in the form of a bill that we will then have a formal vote. Sure. Okay. Is, is that the best way? There's no, if we do that, this is not going to fail. Is that correct? For sure. Well, I, I still will communicate with, yeah. with, with appropriations, but it avoids the possibility of complicating the House Health Care Committee. Okay. I mean, the miscellaneous committee. To respond, would it, it would be would it be fair to say that it doesn't in any way increase the likelihood that this fails relative to including it? In, yeah. I think that was that your question. Yes. No. 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 no it, it actually increases the likelihood of something else we're doing, yeah. not getting encumbered in help in appropriations for a period of time. <coughs> okay. okay. Well, so let's, let's 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 leave that there then. But okay. be prepared to uh, be prepared for us to put that to a committee vote later today. Assuming Jen gets a chance to craft it into a committee. Okay. So this next piece is not new language you haven't seen, except that it's paired way back. Um, because in talking with the Appropriations Committee, this is the part which is a little technical. In fact, in many ways, it's, although it's based on key philosophy about integration, the same topic, it, it's a technical change in the budget process, which is at its core saying, you know, our, we should not be siloing our budgets and splitting up where in the budget uh, mental health share shows up, beginning the first step being about inpatient mental health care. If you recall when the budgets were introduced to us earlier this year, uh, even, even in budget adjustments, saying, well, we have this increase in rate for the retreat because of their financial situation. Part of that showed up in the DIVA budget, part of it showed up in the DMH budget. So this is really just about um, having them be in the DIVA budget together. The original language we looked through um, had this long piece about why this was important. Um, it was language that was important to me. <laughs> but, but we got unofficial feedback from the... Becoming important to more people. <laughs> but, but we got unofficial feedback from the Appropriations Committee that they did not have an interest in lengthy um, language about all the whys and the values and so forth. And they, they just wanted to get to the kind of the bottom line. So um, that's really the fundamental change from the language from before. Um, if, if, if you, uh, it, it does still retain the core purpose language, which is A, there, um, that the, pointing out that the budget's an essential structural component about integrated care, and that separating budgets is an obstacle to that reform principle of um, ensuring equal access. This time we have the actual quote, so that's the section that was referred to on the Integration Council just before. This is a principle that we've adopted already, ensuring equal access to appropriate mental health care in a manner equivalent to other aspects of health care. Um, so that's A. Um, B is just the directive, shall integrate the public funding, in other words, Medicaid, um, for inpatient mental health care with the funding for other health care services within the DIVA budget. Um, oversight and utilization review um, and how the care is managed is the, the more policy end. That's the Department of Mental Health's role, so it's noting that it, that will maintain according to which department is um, legally uh, overseeing that. Um, on the request of those departments, the, the date for it actually to occur will be uh, basically in, to be achieved in fiscal year 2023, which means proposed for the 2022 budget. In other words, not this year, but the year after. And based on that, there is the new section, section B, which says, because we're giving you an extra year, next year you do have to come back with that 
kind of layout showing us exactly where the money is in each budget um, so that it makes it clearer for that next step the year after uh, to actually do it. And, it. and it outlines the existing categories of where this money gets currently split up in inpatient care. So, you, so as we scroll down, you see one, two, three, four. Um, that, those are the different categories of inpatient psychiatric care uh, and the different categories of which some are in uh, DIVA's budget and some are in DF DMH. And folks who are in the CRT, Community Rehabilitation and Treatment Programs, as that line right before the one, two, three, four points out, they can be in any one of those four subcategories, therefore determining whether they're in the DMH or the DIVA budget. So we're saying, fill us in next year on where all those pieces are following. And then the subsequent year, they will all be moved into DIVA. This has absolutely no impact. This language and this directive has absolutely no impact on the budget itself or the amount of money. That's subject to the normal budget process. What it does is move it in terms of which budget it appears in to put it in the budget with the rest of our health care budget. Um, so that's the overview of the now much briefer language, um, and if the commissioner would like to testify. And my understanding is that the commissioner of DIVA has spoken with you, and you are representing um, both departments as testimony on the record about this. Yes, the Agency of Human Services as a whole has reviewed this, um, and we are aligned um, with the recommendations um, as proposed in the bill language. Um, and just to echo the vice chair's points, that um, this really does provide the structural components of creating um, conditions that will support the integration of mental health within the broader health care system. Many other states have actually transitioned to finance integrated financing models um, where managed care plans manage all the physical and mental health programs um, for Medicaid enrollees. Um, so this is aligned with, I think, national practices and where other states are moving. Um, again, a goal of this is to enhance shared data, incentives, tools to deliver integrated services. Um, the area that I think we just um, want to be careful about um, and thoughtful about um, is that um, the, I guess the potential of this integration uh, of the fiscal part of it uh, is really hinged on our ability to ensure that clinical integration is also happening when we think about care coordination. Um, so it's important that uh, for those with complex health and social needs that the outcome of this is that their care is better coordinated and we have better outcomes. So I just don't want to lose sight of, you know, that is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so broadly, um, the Agency of Human Services supports this as it's currently written. The timeline feels appropriate from our perspective. Um, and I just want to note a few other points related to the custodial and legal, legal role of the Department of Mental Health. Um, so there are some differences between the Department of Mental Health and DIVA. It's important that we recognize that DMH is not an administrator of health insurance like DIVA. Um, we are responsible for prioritizing and managing the care of specific populations. Um, as a custodial commissioner, um, I feel an enormous responsibility um, to the individuals who are under the care and custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health. Um, so we want to make sure that as we move towards integrated financing, and this is, I think, reflected in this bill, um, that for those who are under the care and custody of the commissioner, particularly for those who are level one, um, my care management team manages the care coordination of those individuals from the time that they are in the emergency department, admitted to inpatient, and then transitioning to lower levels of care. So when we think about that integration of the fiscal components and the clinical and programming components, I just really want to ensure that the Department of Mental Health is still overseeing that care coordination. Um, that feels essential from my perspective. Um, when we look at the current budgets between DMH and DIVA, um, as the Vice Chair noted, um, that what currently sits in the DMH budget that is separate from or carved out from the DIVA budget um, is level one. Um, so that level one is inclusive of the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Um, our level one contracts with Rutland Regional Medical Center 
and the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, so you'll note at the very end of this, um, there is uh, noted language related to that our budget presentation that the Vice Chair was noting shall also include any implementation recommendations to achieve that integrated funding. I do think there are some pieces that we'll have to work out behind the scenes um, because there's current statutory language of the Department of Mental Health um, related to level one and reasonable actual costs. Um, so if those funds shift over to DIVA, um, then would those contracts for level one need to be facilitated by DIVA versus the Department of Mental Health? And there are some pieces that we will have to coordinate around there. Not insurmountable, um, but certainly some things that we want to think about um, because those level one contracts are essential um, to us actually creating some accountability um, so that those Rutland um, and Bombardable Retreat actually accept those individuals. Um, so that's a little bit of an accountability and a leverage point for the Department of Mental Health. Um, well, that I should reflect when the commissioner pointed those pieces to me, yeah. and it was that was where, um, in helping to craft this, I agreed that um, providing that extra year instead of saying this shall happen for next year's budget um, made sense. Yes. Um, the other thing that I would note is that uh, VPCH is also currently all within um, the Department of Mental Health's budget. The Rock Psychiatric Care Hospital is run by the Department of Mental Health. They're by my people, they're the staff. Um, so if that entire budget moves to DIVA, that will just be another point that we'll have to navigate in terms of the budget for the hospital will actually sit in a different department than the department that's running the hospital itself. So again, that's why I requested the additional time because I, we need to respectively figure out how that will work and how we operationalize that um, and maintain the great outcomes and quality that we're currently achieving for Mount Psychiatric Care Hospital. Um, so those, I think that's the summary of my points for the committee related to this proposed language. On the surface, I mean, this is the integration seems simple, it's, it's a short bill. But is this going to, behind the scenes, add more bureaucracy or trying to coordinate or, you know, it, you know, you're talking about we'll work these things out behind the scenes, but in the end, is there going to be another layer? that we're not seeing, sort of like the unintended consequences of bureaucracy? I think that there are certainly going to be some coordination pieces that we will have to work out behind the scenes. They do not feel insurmountable from my perspective, um, and I think the bigger gain that we're going to make in terms of the fiscal integration of the funding outweighs some of the inconvenience <laughs> of having to work out some of these things behind the scenes. Um, I think managing uh, the BPCH budget is probably my bigger concern and what that means from an operational standpoint. Um, we already have an MOU with DIVA in terms of um, their kind of delegating Medicaid authority related to level one CRT that we oversee. We work very closely together and have a lot of collaboration. Um, so I'm confident that we'll be able to move that forward. And then if we have some time to work with our fiscal offices about the details of the BPCH budget, um, I don't think that we're going to get overly bogged down in bureaucracy um, if those are clear. And I think the language actually supports that because there's clarity of roles that's already articulated in the language. Okay. I, well, I was going to say, I, I didn't understand this yesterday, and I, I think I have a clearer picture now of what we're talking about. And what you just said makes me feel a little bit better that you're, you're comfortable that the, the benefits of making the switch will outweigh whatever additional work there is. Lucy? Was there any discussion of like making the switch except for the v VPCH and keeping that in DMH for logistical ease? That is not currently the recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we truly want to get a picture of inpatient services without VPCH as part of that integration, um, we miss a big part of it. Um, so there have been no discussions as of right now in terms of curving out VPCH from the intent of this language. So the ultimate goal is about having the, the big picture of this 
services all in one place from That's a budget correct. perspective. That's correct. And that doesn't work between the two. Like, it doesn't work to have that big picture when it's split between the two departments. It makes it more challenging to have that big picture, and it's not aligned with our vision of integration. delicate questions, and I don't mean to criticize you or your department, or anything like that. but I, I read one, um, somewhere where there was an incident with your department and I guess the corrections department in which a, an ill patient, um, whether that patient should go to a hospital emergency room setting versus um, going to um, you know, prison corrections department. And I think your department um, took the stand that that individual should go to a uh, to a prison setting, and and then the, the corrections department had an issue. They felt that uh, there was a budgetary issue, and that's why that individual was being sent to um, the corrections department, uh, a prison. Would, would this bill correct that situation? And do you know what I'm referring to? We have um, a lot of situations where the bright line between criminal justice, criminal justice system, criminogenic behavior, and mental health um, is blurred. Um, and it's confusing. Um, and this is, I think, one of the opportunities we have right now when we think about a true forensic system of care that we're grappling with. Um, so I don't think that this in particular addresses that particular issue. What I can assure you is that the Department of Mental Health as a health care provider um, is managing individuals who might be involved in the criminal justice system um, to meet their acute mental health needs within an acute care system that is all Medicaid funded. Um, if we are able to treat an individual and their mental illness, um, it is the requirement that we have to transition them to lower levels of care. Um, that is how, that's philosophically and fundamentally what Vermont, um, a fundamental value of Vermont. Um, federally, that's what we have to do to meet those mandates. Those decisions are not made for budgetary decisions. Those are clinical decisions that are made um, to ensure that people are receiving the right care at the right time in the right place. Um, and for some individuals, they might also have criminogenic behaviors and public safety risk um, that we also have to manage. And so we have to work responsibly with our criminal justice partners. The so, other piece sorry. I would just add is that um, sometimes, because um, we are a health care provider, um, we have to abide by um, protected health information. Um, so what you hear publicly or in the media might not actually reflect um, kind of the true state of the situation. Um, and that's that's just something the Department of Mental Health has to manage on a daily basis. Thank you. And I was going to say, well, just in, to finish this piece, we will, there is a bill coming over mm -hmm. this from the Senate that will be asking the House to look a little bit more into that issue of uh, criminal justice, forensic, mental health, um, which is separate from this issue of when there is mental health hospitalization, does it go into the DIVA or the DMH budget? So okay. the Department of Corrections aspect is not in this bill. That issue is going to be coming to us. Thank you, Anne. And then um, one other question. If we already have an MOU, or if you already have an MOU, why do we need a bill? Because the MOU, um, allows us, it's really just delegating Medicaid authority. Um, so it doesn't address the integration of the funding within the DIVA budget, which is what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. Other questions? So this is language that we only need a vote, not as a bill, but on um, sending it to ask appropriations to include it in the budget bill, because this is a budget um, alignment issue, not a, obviously it has policy behind it, but it's not a, an independent bill. Again, just to explain that the budget always includes both numbers and appropriations, but there's also there's also lang budget language that reflects about how to move things around or, in this case, integrate uh, differently. So, uh, and the budget, the appropriations committee has asked all committees, 
if we have language for the budget to have that prepared for them by tomorrow. So they, they are anticipating the possibility of this as language. Yes, the, the person in charge of that, like, actually, I had told them, well, it's on our agenda Thursday. She said, good, I want it Thursday. So, <laughs> just okay. so are people, are your questions answered? Are you we prepared to? Um, I would do it as a straw poll, really, to, to move it to the budget language. Yes, Henry. I do have. Um, at the end, when they say uh, including any subdivision between the person served by the community we have in treatment program, they list those. Um, there's no really report, and I know we hate reports, but report back on yeah, we have these problems worked out, or there's unintended consequences, or we need more time, or is there someone that's going to ride herd on this and bring it back to So the, the language committee? Um, B that you see here, mm -hmm. uh, the department's fiscal year 2022 budget presentation, which will be our way of articulating the integrated budgets, even though we're not there yet operationally, mm -hmm. also includes implementation recommendations. Um, so part of our budget report back to sending this committee um, will also include implementation recommendations related to some of the areas that um, the Department of Mental Health has some, you know, coordination concerns that we need to work out. So that's what that language is intended to do. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, then I would um, suggest that we... Uh, Take this language. I take a straw poll on recommending that this language be moved into or be given to the appropriations committee as budget language. All those in favor, show your hands. Uh, let the record show that all sure, members Brian. present. And Brian, are you on the line still? Do you wish to join us in this? I am on the line. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I am here. Okay, well, we will, I think at this point we have a clear um, all members present and we will, that's sufficient to move, move the language to the appropriations committee and we will, uh, we will do that. And we'll, we'll have you, you can weigh in as you wish along the way because it will be in the final budget as well. Okay, thank you. Now, there. One last piece which uh, we've discussed before, so I'm, I'm hoping this is sort of a, uh, we're already there on it, but uh, this last piece um, is the technical language to achieve um, the uh, Brattleboro Retreat's budget being um, under the Green Mountain Care Board um, in the same way all other hospital budgets are. Um, this had been proposed last year. The retreat had concerns about being fully included, so we sort of created a special language um, review light, if you will, and um, in light of some of the budget uh, issues that came up this year, um, some folks like me thought, hey, we need uh, to have it um, fully um, under the Green Mountain Care Board's review um, process. Um, so what this language does is it strikes the, the special carve-out language that we created last year, um, and then the line after that is just a, um, the definitional, the existing definitional talks about hospitals meaning a general hospital, um, and general hospital excludes psychiatric hospitals. So by striking the word general, it means any licensed hospital, mm -hmm. but Clearly, the one budget that doesn't come under the Green Mountain Care Board is the state-run hospital, VPCH. Um, their budget is controlled by the legislature and wouldn't be controlled by the Green Mountain Care Board, so it requires adding the, the language that we're not including hospitals that are uh, run by the state. So this is the way that achieves the, um, the, the purpose of saying the Brattleboro Retreats budget um, does come under the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, we did have on the record previously testimony from uh, the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board and the, and the director saying 
they're fine with this. This does not add uh, a burden on them that requires additional staff requests. Sometimes we ask them to do things, resources of any kind. Sometimes we ask them to do things and they say, look, if you're asking us to do something more, we would need more resources to be able to do it. And they um, told us on the record that's not the case with this. They can handle this with their existing uh, resources. Questions? Are we going to hear from the Brattleboro retreat? We have. We, they, they testified earlier on the record to in support of this. Okay. When they were here. They won Lewis Stevens. Oh, oh, okay. That's oh, oh no. yes. I forgot that. Oh, no. Yes, Earlier. when Lewis, when when, Lewis, when when he was here talking about the retreat. Yes, yeah, specifically yeah. when he was here about the retreat early on in the session, and we we raised this issue and said it was likely we would be wanting to do this as a recommendation, and he indicated no problem. Right. I just, am, I guess, I'm, it. Maybe I'll go back on the record and look at it. It just it strikes me as interesting because last year when we brought it up, there seemed to be lots of problems from the right. retreat's perspective. And, and things shifted. I, I'm no, I know. It's just I, I'm curious as to how what what has been done to resolve the problems that the retreat had last year with it. I'd be happy to share. Yeah. And I think the issues were not one of difficulty. I think the issues were one of. Uh, transparency and last year what we agreed to was that the Secretary of Human Services would have access to Brattleboro Retreats records sufficiently to know that they were confident in giving the kinds of support increases and rate increases and uh, at the time it was Secretary Gobey uh, and he so we, we agreed to back off from asking to have it go through the Green Mountain Care Board as a hospital budget review and then I think in light of the uh, frankly, the emergent situation, which we were addressing in the very first days of the session, where the Brattleboro Retreat was here with uh, Mike Smith from the Agency of Human Services. It was in that context, uh, before they had resolved how to resolve it, uh, that we also raised the question of having the Brattleboro Retreat uh, be, have the, given a significant amount of their budget, which is in fact state funds now, uh, be part of the hospital budget review that, that he indicated that that was not an issue at this time. Other, other questions? This uh, Again, this is not a freestanding bill. This is a recommendation that approaches has already come <coughs> anticipating that uh, we might be proposing. Well, let me just say out loud, it doesn't seem like that has seems satisfactory. I can tell when there's a consensus in the room when there isn't. Uh, so if that's not satisfactory, I want to hear from, I want to yeah, hear what we need to do to... There seems uh, some uncertainty on faces. Yeah, yeah right. right. Uh, do, does the committee wish to hear from the Brattleboro Retreat directly about this? In which case, we will try our best to arrange that. I, I remember them saying, and I sort of too. being yeah. very... Okay. Well, I'm just, I just wanted to check because I don't. I'm, I think this it was is one not of the questions this, this, I had. What's that? I think it was one of the questions I had when yeah. they were here. Mm -hmm. But, Lori, my my um, response is quite frankly, it really doesn't matter to me if they are in favor of it that we have <laughs> a situation on our hands and we need to. They need to be part of the process. So I'm I'm for this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I just feel like there's clearly dynamics that I'm missing, especially, I mean, I guess that's where I feel is I maybe need to understand more of the dynamics and and said earlier that we, we could have a conversation. So I guess in my mind, it just kind of feels like maybe that needs to happen before I would feel I, I, ready to. I will say it. To I will say it on the record. It's not very distant from what um, <laughs> Lori's saying. I think last year um, they felt in a if they felt able to argue that um, they didn't, they were a private hospital, and that um, I mean, their their fundamental argument, which which I believe to really be an issue of not wanting to be as fully transparent as is required of other hospitals. That's my opinion. Their argument was because they're so significantly funded by Medicaid um, and the. Uh, Green Mountain Care Board review 
the, the bottom line of the review is the Green Mountain Care Board has the authority to say you can't increase your, you know, your rates. It's, it's a, um, by more than X percent. Um, and um, the other hospitals are able to do cost shifting inside their budgets um, that allow for, uh, if they're required to reduce private uh, payment, they, you know, they, their amount of Medicaid is less in terms of all of that functional pieces of the budget. And so the retreat was saying last year, well, we don't think we should be part of that because they can't, you know, we're, we have so much of our budget that's state controlled because of Medicaid. Um, and I think this year the retreat recognized that, quite frankly, you know, from a political perspective, recognized that they weren't in a position to say, um, we're not comfortable with being required to be evaluated as closely as other hospitals' budgets are. Mm -hmm. And so they were not objecting anymore. And the Green Mountain Care Board clearly will, will have to look at their budget understanding the percent that's Medicaid in terms of um, how it reviews it. Do we have a sense of how much it will cost the retreat to undergo the, the budget review process? Um, no. I mean, we have asked that. Um, they did last year, based on the new language, have to start providing um, a good deal of the information that is required of hospitals uh, for budget review. Um, but yeah. It just seems like an interesting time to be asking them to do something that's going to put more costs on them when we already know that. Well, I, I would take the position that it's also a very interesting time, and it's an interesting time when they, in fact, are turning to the state for an additional million and a half dollars, when we're already giving them millions of dollars, when, when their entire budget is practically now state-funded, uh, that it's the time when they should be, uh, even at some additional cost, they should be fully transparent, and they should be not treated differently. Just again, it's it's interesting in terms of the, what we were talking about earlier, the integration of mental health and the healthcare system. They are a siloed mental health inpatient facility, or not in well. well that, they do other stuff, but, but, yeah, but they're not strictly in inpatient. But I, I think that you know I don't think that we should be making them an exception, uh, or based on the fact that their their primary exclusive work is around mental health and substance use disorders. I, I think they should be treated the same as other hospitals. Um, just to answer that a little bit, at least in my experience at Gifford, the, actually the work that goes into presenting the Green Mountain Care Board is sort of presenting the financials you already have. I mean, they do have some format that they want. I would say the bigger issue might be if then the Green Mountain Care Board comes back and says well, we want a sustainability plan like they're trying to, to put on other hospitals now, yeah. which might involve a little more cost. But they would do it for a reason, and they only do it when the hospitals are financially struggling, and we want to see how it's going to move That's forward. exactly so, why we want that's that's why we do it. They, they should board. spend whatever time it takes. Yeah. I'm sure Secretary Smith would agree with this. I would think so. Okay. So I'm... I'm going to ask that we uh, put a straw vote to move it to the language in the budget uh, as well. Those, by show of hands, those is, in favor? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, it is abstaining a possibility on a straw no. vote? No. <laughs> oh, on a straw vote? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's fine. Uh, this is a straw vote, yeah. On, on an actual roll call yeah. vote, you can't abstain. So those in favor of uh, moving it to the budget by show of hands? Uh, any, those opposed, those abstaining? Okay, great, so we'll move to the budget. Thank you. Okay, so I'm now going to, we're, things are shifting uh, as, we're, as we're sitting and talking. Um, the, um, yes, Sarah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. And we'll let you shift. Yes, thank you. We'll let you shift. Mark, I really appreciate okay, it. Great. No, thank you for making yourself. We really appreciate it. Um, while we were working, I was also being communicated with by the speaker's office, and there is a chair's meeting uh, that's being called for 10.30. 
and I'm being asked, the chairs are being asked to meet with the speaker at 10.30. Um, one of the issues that uh, we are being asked to talk about, so I'm going to ask us that we're going to, I'm going to ask this committee to help me weigh in on a question. Um, and then we'll figure out how to get back to affordability, which is on our agenda, which you know, yes. we just have to be flexible. Um, let me make sure. concerns is what I am hearing about most and people being able to 
quarantine um, and not, uh, you know, they not have to worry about mortgages um, and whether that means finding a way to encourage um, lien holders to allow mortgage holidays for a month. Um, I, the paid paid sick leave, paid paid family medical leave. It would have been great if we had a strong program. That's a kind of a moot point, but if there's anything that can be done on the short term to help people with their incomes um, while they're quarantining. Okay. Let's just keep going around and hear from you. Just, just to follow up uh, on, on that, as an employer, what I'm hearing from employees is, will you pay us if we are sick? If, we ha if, if we're sick? And I'm sure that there's also, will you pay us if, you know, if you tell us not to work, if, if we're sick, we're quarantined, yeah. yeah. and yeah. we yeah. can't work from home. And, and that uh, larger businesses are making that commitment. L larger national businesses are making that commitment. They have the resources. A smaller business might not. What can the state do to help? I think if you've got this, this COVID-19 virus is obviously quite relevant. If someone's going to be home sick, uh, there should, I think there should be some sort of compensation for someone that has COVID-19, not someone that's sick and trying to cash in on it. You know, people get sick every year and they stay home and they lose a little bit of income. But if this virus is involved and the doctor says you have COVID-19, I think there should be some sort of compensation for that if they have to stay home because of this virus. Yeah, I think um, pretty much echoing what's been said is, is my top concern. I just want to add to the conversation. I know I've raised as like a younger member of the legislature a lot kind of the biases that this position puts us in as far as recognizing that people come to this position from all financial backgrounds, but that we as a legislature likely are biased towards people who could afford to pay for two weeks of ourselves needed. And I think it, it concerns me a lot because I talk to my constituents and I hope that we stay in touch with the fact that we as a legislature may not be representative of our constituents as far as what it would mean to to take. I mean, I just talked to a constituent yesterday who runs a child care center in my town and she said, like, I should close, I think. Like, the responsible thing to do would be to close and I like cannot make it two more weeks if I close, so I'm staying open. Thank you. I th think the whole idea of um, large gatherings is something that people talk about. I mean, like the basketball players, and basketball games, and all this stuff. But then you have the legislature, which just doesn't seem to be following the large groups, they, you know, they were keeping outsiders out, and that's a step. And But still, when you look at the demographics of the people when you're sitting on the floor, those are the ones that are checking all the boxes, like over 60, pre-existing conditions. And I think we are not leading by example. However, I also realize that money is going to be a big deal going forward on budgets and keeping government running it, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, but I think that's something that needs to go into the conversation, of, and I'm sure it is, but we don't know anything about it. So um, that's it. And the other thing is that we are carriers. We are leaving a central point mm -hmm. and going to all points of the state and then coming back again. So um, it's something. Okay. Well, okay. That, I, I don't know the nature of the meeting that mm -hmm. I'm having, but, uh, but I can tell you that that is seriously being thought about and contemplated what it means for us to be here and balancing the need for government to function yeah. and that we, in fact, have a role uh, in how we, how we need that. And one, one last thing. Paid family leave, I don't know how we can we can't do that for another vote. Um, I, that wasn't I, going to be in effect immediately. Yeah, but it's not you can't just roll that. You just can't do that. Oh, well, okay. I mean, there, there. Yeah. I don't want to speak for what yes. can be done in an emergency. I often think about yeah. that. And, uh, yeah. mm. um, and I agree with some of the stuff that's been said. I think the one thing that I've been thinking about and uh, getting a bug in my ear from my 
former representative who's on the board of Capstone is just food yes. and making sure that, I mean, we have a lot of people that, especially kids that get lunch at school and that's schools, really the best meal they're getting. Yeah. Um, and whether we need to consider some sort of centralized food production at a school or at a community center or something that could be distributed out to people that are quarantined. I mean, anytime you're moving things right. around, you're exposing people, but there's, and especially like Meals on Wheels and some of those things we need to think about. I, I, I just wonder, what's the feds doing to help our state? Uh, are they going to provide the state's money uh, to help uh, keep individuals home when they're sick uh, with this virus? Um, you know, it's a difficult time economically. I mean, this could be a very difficult time for our state economically, as well as the nation economically. And we're seeing it in the, in the stock market currently, right. but it has other ways uh, throughout, through our, throughout our, our state and local economies. And, uh, I just worry about um, the money issue. Yeah, I, I, my, Top of my mind has been the issue of um, employment income and, and uh, quarantine, and I think framing it in terms of health care. Um, I can't imagine people not thinking, I don't even want to be tested, because if I'm told I have to self-quarantine, I can't feed my family. And I think even of my, you know, my hairdresser who has the hair salon in her home, and if she says, oh, I have to self-quarantine for some reason, she can't have any customers coming in. Maybe she shouldn't be, but then she has zero income. Uh, or maybe I don't, no customers will be coming in. Or no customers will be coming in. And, and I, I, the issue becomes, of course, the money. I don't know if the workers' comp system is a tool that can be used. I don't know what the tools are, but that's, I think, my health care preeminent concern. Oh, can I mention one other thing sure. uh, besides the economic issue, uh, the medical issue? Do we have the equipment to treat, you know, a major uh, pandemic, particularly when it comes to respirators? How many respirators, you know, does the average hospital have? I'm sure UVM has a great number of them, but um, I mean that's that concerns me. Yeah. I'm just going to add, um, I agree with all of it, I'm particularly concerned about food, not just for children, but seniors and those in need. And also, um, I think the state needs to be helping municipalities and coming up with plans to physically check on seniors and those in need. A little bit to get to Anne's point of, are there people in their home who are sick who are not coming to be tested because they're scared of what the cost is going to be? And just making sure they're OK. Um, Do we get the test? Are there enough tests? It's like there are, there aren't there. You know, no, I, I think just we don't. Don't know it. I think yeah. we don't know it. Uh, I want to just mention a couple things. One is uh, that medications, access to essential medications for people who, in fact, uh, if they're being asked to self quarantine or if, in fact, there's social distancing to the degree that you know, those different things have happened in different settings as this has advanced. Um, and and the barriers to like I mean I was I was approached by someone who said my child needs insulin my family member needs insulin I can't afford to put out what the code pay is for a month's supply of what's being required to get, to, to get to get an advanced supply of medication even though I'm being told try to get advanced supply so that you're not uh, you don't have to worry about that but said we literally don't have the funds to do that. Um, and, and in light of some of what we're talking about, and I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but quite honestly, I think the mental health pressures are going to be there, or they are already elevated for the entire population. And for people, for, for everyone, there's a high, high, significantly high level of anxiety uh, and, and fear, and you, know, you can name it, and just cascade through the issues. Um, 
And I think we need to at least recognize that and recognize that the pressures on all of our formal systems, but our informal systems are going to be, uh, are going to be highly pressured as well. So, please. I know healthcare workers. You know healthcare workers. I mean, that, that's my biggest concern is if this does take off, we have a limited supply. And mm -hmm. how are we going to protect them, keep them safe, keep them working to help the people that are Please. Devin Green from Vermont Association of Health. You got to go. And I need to go to an emergency. I just want to do a quick public service announcement along those lines of protecting hospital resources is um, call your primary care provider, get advice from your primary care provider. Do not physically go to the emergency right. room unless you're short of breath. Right. Don't go to the emergency room if you've had, you know, like I've been putting that up to right. yeah. Good. I'm glad you're doing it because you are the leaders in your community. So, so we're taking our break. Come back at quarter of, see if our chair's back. Yeah. What yes. time? We will hold on to room or 11? 11. 11 o'clock. Okay. 11 o'clock? Have you heard that? Yes, right. Cheers. I'll come back at 11. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Oh, all oh. right. So. So I'm going to just give you some report back from the meeting. I was just a part of um, we met uh, the speaker's office was it was you know an emergency meeting of the chairs and the intent was both to hear what uh, as we did some go around uh, what some what were some of the top ideas to how to respond for Vermonters in this emergency situation um, we did that and many of the I reported back on most of the ideas that we talked about here and then as did others. Um, not every committee had taken time to look at it as a committee, but um, the speaker then uh, asked each committee to take to uh, take take some specific responsibility over the next several days. And I want to share with the, within the framework of uh, trying to see if there were immediate policy changes or financial changes that should be put on the agenda, literally on the agenda on the floor of the house today or tomorrow, uh, and immediate short-term uh, changes. And we were asked specifically uh, to look at the issues of uh, the impact on home health on uh, folks, healthcare workers who are going into settings uh, to sustain um, folks, to look at the issues of mental health and whether there are any financial or policy or financial changes that need to be facilitated to uh, allow what needs to happen over the next immediate period of time. And I also raised the issue of pharmacy uh, and access, uh, and I think uh, issues of access to essential medications or supplies that are sufficient. Um, and, um, and I think quite Apart from that, but in addition is uh, hospital, hospital situation, hospital preparedness. Uh, but I, so I'm going to, uh, and that that we we need to balance uh, trying to find a way to look to, to try to engage the key stakeholders on the, those issues uh, with our committees. That this is as as the speaker said, this is not time to form a task force to figure this out. This is a time to see if there are immediate actions that people are putting on the table that then we can uh, in turn have uh, have drafted this, the speaker's office will take charge of what what the vehicle is if there's once or if there's a decision that something needs to happen uh, so I think I need to step back and look at what we have left on our agenda uh, because every committee also is facing crossover. There's some suggestion that maybe crossover will be moved, but in the meantime, crossover has not been moved. And we're going to try to find a balance between looking at prioritizing what it is we're trying to move forward and uh, with looking at these issues. Now, um, I'm just frankly trying to think out loud right now. 
uh, about how best to proceed. I think um, what we might do is, I think we have a specific proposal in front of us that I think is prepared to that is a longer term, it's not a short term immediate issue, but is a longer term piece, but I think one which we might be able to uh, go through quickly. Uh, and so why don't we do that? In the meantime, uh, I would like to, looking around the room, but also thinking that some of the key players, both around home health issues, uh, mental health issues, and pharmacy issues in terms of carriers, and obviously pharmacy. Uh, so what I'm going to ask is that if you're in the room and you are engaged in that specific, in any of those three specific areas, or in hospital preparedness, uh, that you be thinking about, are there immediate policy changes that you believe should happen and could happen in the near, I mean, in the immediate term, uh, and or financial changes that would be necessary in order to support Vermonters that the legislature has the ability to take steps in the next 48 hours. Uh, I'm asking you to be thinking about that and for us to be reaching out to other stakeholders who are similarly situated. But I think in the meantime, we'll find a time either later today or certainly tomorrow to come back and see whether the, what those proposals are. So I know that some folks who are engaged in these issues are in the room and some are not, but that's if you, to the degree you, you who are can communicate with your stakeholder colleagues who are who would be a key stakeholder on that? If you would ask them, this is a request from the House Health Care Committee to help us think about those immediate policy changes or financial changes, financial issues that could be addressed by the legislature in the next 48 hours. That would be essential in anticipating the needs of the market. Is that? I, mean, I know that doesn't answer a lot of questions, but I think that's the framework that I'm asking us to think, I would ask us as committee members to be thinking in those terms, but I also want to reach out and engage the stakeholder community as well. But I think we have something in front of us which I think we could take a look at, uh, which is a longer term, because we also we also have a longer term responsibility, so we're going to try to balance all these issues. Okay. Nothing. Okay. So I think we have brought some people together around uh, at least one of the proposals longer term, and is definitely longer term, but nevertheless could potentially have to be quite important around uh, prescription drug issues. And Gloria, are you prepared to yep. help us walk through this? And Christina, would you mind? Yeah. Um, and Jessica. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we talked about this, um, and then there was a small group that uh, worked that kind of met separately and, and talked through how we can make this happen. So um, we have some language that I will walk through, or Christine, if you want to walk, you want to walk through it. Whatever you prefer. Okay. Why don't you walk through it since okay. you drafted it, and then we'll answer questions, and then just here to, to respond as well. So Christina McLaughlin, Green Mountain Care Board. I can't take full credit for drafting it, but it was a group effort at the board. Uh, so in front of you is some, and it is posted online, some proposed language. Oh. Uh, this proposed language uh, for the board to um, develop a prescription drug technical advisory group um, to do exactly what it says, um, have some transparency around prescription drugs. So. Just to read through it, the Green Mountain Care Board shall establish a prescription drug technical advisory group pursuant to 18 BSA uh, section 9374 E2 to provide input and recommendations to the topics described in subsection B to the board uh, through January 15th, 2022. The board shall appoint interested stakeholders with applicable subject matter expertise as appropriate. Part B, the prescription drug technical advisory group may provide recommendations to the board on one or more of the following topics. One of models that enhance the board's ability to analyze, monitor, or report the pricing of prescription drug products or the relationship between prescription drug pricing and consumer prescription drug costs, the effectiveness of prescription drug initiatives on prescription drug costs, or three other mechanisms for increasing prescription drug price transparency at one or more levels of prescription drug supply chain. 
The Green Medical Board shall provide a report to the General Assembly on or before January 15th, 2022, based on the recommendations from this advisory group. And we suggested that the effective date is effective upon passage. So I have a question. Why the 2022 date? So at the board and working with Jeff, we kind of, Jeff Hochberg, uh, we agreed that either we ask for money so we can contract out some of this work or we can not ask for money and have a little more time to work on this. And we felt the no money ask was a safer bet. Any questions? I, I don't see, I mean, we're analyzing, we're monitoring. I don't see where we're actually taking any action to decrease the cost of pharmaceuticals in Vermont. So that is somewhat of the intent of this. It is to bring in all these experts and others to develop this a model or options for the board to uh, review and analyze prescription drug crop drug costs and see what the best mode of action is. Um, I think we, I mean, with this Friday deadline and just with, this is pretty broad language and we wanted it to be broad so that we had some more power right. to but, develop. But again, I just don't see the action in this at all, other than monitoring and... So, and I guess if I were to be completely honest, if we were to take action, uh, the path would have maybe a lot of resistance. So, I, I know there is this struggle to want to have action, and maybe Jeff can speak more of this as well, because he is in this I, way. You know, I want to see prescription drugs at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. I want to see insulin uh, products at a lower cost, and I just don't see that this bill can, can I chime in um, on a friend, Christina, because I know you know this, but you probably don't have it at the top of your mind. Because you did bear it, Executive Director of the Mountain Care Board. Um, we, as and also this committee, has worked closely with NASHPE, um, National Academy of State Health Policy. Um, they're a nonpartisan um, group that brings together states to work on issues such as they have a, a task force on prescription drug price transparency and reduction in prices of um, cost control for prescription drugs. And I, have, I was an initial member of that task group, so task force. So they are working right now on some additional um, programs that are not ready for prime time, and so we can't share the specifics with you that we believe we would like to work on with them and could fit into this language and does exactly, the intent of the work that they're doing is going exactly where you're going in terms of getting to the root of the matter. So I don't know if there's language we could add, like to work with Nashby on additional, um, I don't, I, I don't know what else I can say. I mean, we, say. we will work with Nashby either way. We are and we have been. And the time is just off. Yeah. I, I, I believe Trish Riley said that within the next Trish month. From yes, the exactly. next month or two, it will be up and proposed. And as long as everything goes well, again, we just can't, it cannot be shared at this time. And if I can just add one thing regarding Nashby and the brain. We worked with them on the drug importation for those who weren't here at the time. So there is a working relationship that's established with them, which is good. Are you good? I know you're not good, but you can ask me questions. Well, I, I, I guess I would just also say if we had something that we that we could put on the table to take direct action on at this point in time, would we put it on the table? I don't think we have that. Uh, I know the Senate is. The Senate has looked at uh, issues around insulin and capping insulin co-pays or some element of that. That will be coming over from the Senate. That's why we did not take that specific issue up in this committee. Uh, but uh, there are... And I don't think we're prepared at this point. There's a bill, the bill in front of us uh, that would task the Green Mountain Care Board with actually setting uh, caps on uh, prices and 
controls on prescription drug prices. Uh, I don't think we have the ability to move that that bill is that would not move anywhere at this point in time. It would simply grind into endless uh, testimony. But I think the intent is to try to give the Green Mountain Care Board some additional ability to dig into prescription drug pricing issues in particular and position them uh, to work with us with more specific targeted proposals that hopefully will emerge in the medium term, if not the near term. Exactly. Well, I, I, I would just say, if I have your assurances that, that, and that you're going to do something, that we're going to have some sort of action, hopefully, uh, and that I will support this bill. You know. I think it, it, it's, a, it's a frustration that we don't have some, and, and the, the issues are complex about what we can do at the state level and what can be done at the federal level. We're kind of caught in the midst of a lot of this. Nashville likes to continuously remind us that uh, a lot of these proposals that they have is met with resistance, and that takes time and money sometimes. So we were trying to, I think everyone agrees that we need to do more. It's just we need to find out what's the best path to do more. David and Lucy. Brian. Oh, Brian. I've been listening to this. Advisory groups, suggestion groups. Uh, we're going to look into this. We're going to think about it. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to discuss it by January 15, 2022. That's sitting in a room pedaling a bicycle and pedaling and pedaling, pedaling, getting absolutely nowhere. In a year or two years from now, you're still sitting in the same living room pedaling a bicycle. And Right now, in, in the Green Mountain Care Board, it's had plenty of time to do something about this, about prescription drugs, and nothing's been done. And that's all we do in here is talk about it and listen to people talk about it. Why doesn't somebody actually do something? So, so our regulatory role is given to us by the legislature. Um, so what we work on is in statute, and with our limited staff, that's what we can do, and um, there were a m many, there were various bills proposed that would have given us that more authority. But like Chair Lippert just mentioned there, and, and I would say, I mean, I've only been in this committee for a couple of years, but every year we have tried to take steps, and it is frustrating and it is slow. Um, steps particularly around, around prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yes, and it's frustrating and it's slow. And in, in some regards, we have our hands tied between, as Bill said, what we can do versus what the feds have to do. Um, I hear your frustration. I, I'm there, too. I mean, prescription drugs is one of the reasons we have high health care costs. So I think this is a good step in the right direction. I wish it was more, too, but I think it's what we can do. I could remind this committee that there are other reports that the state, I mean, the board has a report relating to prescription drug right. costs. There are There's many transparency reports that are for transparency. So this is really to see what action we can take and just kind of evaluate, just like everyone has mentioned, what the state's power can and be. And can, can I be blunt and just say that if we had a proposal on the table here for the Green Mountain Care Board to take specific action, mm -hmm. we would be hearing why would the Green Mountain Care Board, why should they be taking specific action? Mm -hmm. Why should they, why, why should we allow them to take action? Mm -hmm. So I mean, and I'm not, I'm not directing that at, at either of you, but just generally, this is, the, this is the dilemma we are in the midst of, and this is trying to give them some additional ability to work with the appropriate people to develop the capacity uh, for us then to identify and debate, frankly, specific actions. Uh, if we were talking about having the Green Mountain Care Board actually put price controls on prescription drugs, and, which is embedded in one of the bills, we would be needing to take some very extensive testimony. And if we come to that, if we ever come to that, uh, that would be a significant step uh, beyond which uh, we have not given them any type of authority. So it's just, it's, it's a frustration for all of us. Uh, at, at a time when we know that prescription drugs, and I'll just say that for myself, we have, we, have, we passed the first bill on price transparency in the country around prescription drugs. We were the first state to pass a bill around importation, uh, allowing uh, to, to work with the federal government about the potential of Canadian import drugs from Canada. And 
my point of view is we need to keep just taking step after step and not stop. But we are not going to, but there's not a single thing that, that is available to us to do at the moment that I'm aware of. Except um, make noise. Well, we this, is part, this is part of that. Yeah. I agree. I, I, and I think, <laughs> frankly, to be quite honest, and I'll just be really blunt about it, for us to make noise on a bipartisan, tripartisan basis, and that's what we have done successfully up to this point. When we have moved the bills on truck price transparency in the face of objections from the pharma and the pharmaceutical industry, when we did Canadian drug importation, this committee uh, collectively on a tripartisan at the time basis said we need to make noise and we need to make it clear that there's action that needs to be taken. And so I'm hoping that we can continue to do that even in the face of knowing that this is not sufficient. I would like to see more follow-up rather than wait to 2022 on. I know Town & Derby is still waiting for their Y2K generators. That's 20 years ago. They, the, prom, the state promised the Town & Derby generators when we're going to turn into Y2K. Still waiting for them. I hope we don't have to wait that long for something like this to happen. That might be a little bit of an over-exaggeration. Can we add a line about giving Derby their generators? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think we should do that. <laughs> and where are the generators? 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 Where towards this, I, I think Christina did an excellent job describing the conundrum we're in, that we have um, other duties we're performing and we are very, um, to your point about the, the task force and the technical advisory group, we have a very successful technical advisory group, the primary care advisory group that actually I believe brought to light a lot of the workforce issues that you're dealing with now. So I think that this is a promising avenue. Um, and I, I don't know if you want to put in a check-in. We're happy to do that next year as a, a you know a progress on our on our I, I mean a check-in on our progress. That's that's I, easy enough. And if I we think are, that would be absolutely appropriate because that's what yeah. that's what our expectation is. That, we're, that this is not something we're going to sit back and wait until 2022 for. Me. If we are being honest too, this this has no cost attached, but it will take a lot of staff time. And our after the session ends, our we are quite busy. So um, we are happy to do a January check-in if that's what Can January twenty twenty one. Can you add the January check-in, January, January twenty twenty one check-in, how committees and the appropriate. Year. That helps you blame us too. Yes, absolutely. It does as much, but you know. As Lucy said before, we, we ask for stuff and then we run out of time. And we're a very transparent board, so we will most likely have a committee page on this. We will post meeting information. We, you know, we we will make this as transparent as possible. Okay. Given given the context in which we're doing all of this, I'm going to suggest that. Thank you. Unless there are other specific questions for Christina, there are. Okay. Um, I just was. Did you? You also did. Go ahead. Um, I just was wondering what. What in this is outside of the board's current powers versus, in, like, what new authority does this grant the board? So this actually, this really does it. That's, we came to this realizing we can use our existing authority to create a technical advisory group. And since there were all these other bills that were this bigger ask, we took into consideration all the other bills and came up with this, that we... Um, felt, we, I mean, we can't make everyone happy, but we felt with working with Jeff Hopford and um, internally that this is what we can do with our current staff, our current timeline. And so this isn't giving us anything new per se, but this is, I mean, to put in language that we will come back and report in 2021 and 2022. Really. Yeah. Um. These, I have two questions, and they may not be best directed at you, so you can say so if you want. I, I'm not clear on what, a, in number two, what a prescription drug initiative would mean. Um, 
So the effectiveness of prescription drug initiatives, I guess when we propose recommendations as to how to control prescription drug costs or be more transparent or whatever it may be, how effective those initiatives may be. Okay. So then if everyone understands that that's what that means, the language just seemed a little vague, prescription drug initiative, but if it's clear to the board, then good. And then I'm also not clear myself on, in number one, uh, the difference between pricing and costs. So we're using both of those terms to mean mm -hmm. not the same thing? So I, I guess pricing is pricing, which can mean various things, but costs to, say, the consumers, the... The ultimate cost of the consumer. So when we say the relationship in the end of part one, relationship between prescription drug pricing and consumer pr prescription drug costs, that's retail or list pricing? Is that what we mean by the first? List, yeah, list pricing, but then the cost, there's so many. There's I mean, so many. Yes, yeah, I, I can help. So there's, you know, there's, there's quite a few different costs, um, and Jeff could probably take a minute yeah. and walk through it when he comes up. That happened through the, the supply chain, and then what does the customer and, mm -hmm. and the patient end up paying? It's, there's a lot. I mean, when we drafted our last bill, it was very kind of like wholesale acquisition costs versus some other costs. We'll let Jeff mm -hmm. comment to that. So hold that sure. question, David. Okay. Anything else for the Green Care Board? Sorry. Yeah, I have one more question. I don't know whether it, 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 whether this bill um, should cover this, um, whether it's an issue that you would look at. Um, but it has to do with the coronavirus. Uh, I don't know what type of, of pharmaceuticals or meds that will be uh, required uh, to attack this virus. Um, but will the Green Mountain Care Board also be looking at, say, price gouging uh, that I'm sure will probably come up eventually? I, I'm sh yeah, I'm sure. <clears throat> I mean, that's why we kept this language pretty broad. It's we can look at everything and anything. So this would be covered and would be reported, I guess. If you, yeah. I think that's an important point. I think you know, in this in this kind of emergent situation, we would particularly need to be aware of protecting Vermonters from being exploited. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Jeff, would you like to comment? Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> So, Jeff Hawkberg, uh, Vermont Retail Druggist uh, and Pharmacy Owner in the State. Um, first, uh, I think I need a tissue to cry because I think the, the comments that I just heard from the committee about wanting to do more to tackle this, uh, it's been my almost career endeavor here for the last 10 years of advocating to this committee and others about the need for transparency, the need to, to make change. Um, and what I've come to learn you know, maybe apart from maybe Susan and maybe Mike, who've probably been at this a little bit longer than I have, um, the, the point I'd like to make is that, um, you know, I can come here and I can give you a bill. I could give you NCOIL's recommended language for reforming PBM that's going to have downward effect on, on patient co-pays today, but then turn around a year from now, it may have lasting impacts on premiums. Um, and I can say that I'm being underpaid on these drugs, I'm being overpaid on these drugs. The hospitals are, are, are having you know, excess access issues. Um, these meds, the 3.B pricing, the insulin pricing, there's so many factors that go into this that the one thing that I've learned over the years is that what we need more than anything is true, reliable data to move forward effectively. And that's what this bill does. And that's why we fully support this bill. Um, and it is, I think it's a milestone um, to really put it in statute to actively drive uh, a, a cost containment data acquisition uh, program that is going to perpetuate throughout our lifetimes. And, and that's what's key. Is we could institute something today, we may not see any savings tomorrow. And we want to be able to make sound decisions going forward because we've tried things in the past and they just haven't panned out. Well, why? And we hear from different stakeholders. You hear from me that, you know, this is what's going on in pharmacy. We hear from the insurers, this is what's going on in the insurance world. So there are, there's a lot to it. Um, 
and you know, I'm very thankful that this committee is uh, concerned and wants to act today. Um, but I think this is going to be the next this appropriate step um, to move forward effectively, uh, and given the time crunch, uh, to move forward this year to have something that actually goes across and, and without drawing in just everyone from the liberals. Um, so that said, we fully support this bill, and I'd like to thank the Green Mountain Care Board for their work on, on coming up with this. Um, and I'm always available to come here and testify more to uh, the comings and goings of pharmacy matters. Um, and um, I'll just start by saying, too, that one, I don't have any hand sanitizer available for you. Um, so I can't, I can't sell anymore. It's not available to me. I thought you wanted some right now. <laughs> um, I have my own stockpile at home. Thank you, though. Um, but um, to, uh, to the board's, or to the committee's uh, <coughs> chairman, your, your comments earlier about what some of the things we need to think about now in the, in the immediate. Um, I have actually thought about this. Uh, we've been in just active discussion uh, both within our store group, uh, with other stores. Um, I've been in conversation recently with the national, national committees. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on about what is going on currently. And there are going to be access issues. There already are access issues. I think one thing that I would like to stress to this community that um, I would, thinking outside of the box, some things that I would like to see are maybe an emergency access request. Okay, you asked the question about what are the treatments for coronavirus. Viruses are a heck of a lot of treatment. Um, unless you have a drug that's developed specific to target a specific virus, uh, there's little you can do other than really protect against uh, treat symptoms and you can treat uh, secondary infections. Um, what we're seeing and what we're being told um, at the pharmacy level now is to try to gain access to inhalers, to steroids, to um, antibiotics, and all of those are already under allocation from all the wholesalers. So the wholesalers are already limiting how much is available to the, to the local pharmacies and to the hospital entities. Um, so the drug supply chain has been disrupted, and a lot of it has to do with China, because 80% uh, of the raw ingredients used to manufacture all drugs in the United States come from India and China. So there will be a slowdown that will be perpetuated beyond this quarter. It will continue on at least through quarter two um, before we see a true reform of it. Also, the drugs that are going to be, that are being investigated um, by the big manufacturers, uh, by Gilead, by AbbVie, you see these in the headlines. These drugs are all uh, very expensive drugs. Uh, they're usually limited distribution drugs, um, and they're usually restricted network drugs. What I would, I think what, one thing that I think would be helpful is that maybe an emergency measure to make, to require that these drugs be available to every access point possible within our system. Every retail community pharmacy should be able to access these products as appropriate um, and, and go through so that we can distribute to the general public as quickly as possible. So let me ask you specifically about that because we are looking for immediate recommendations, but that sounds to me like that's probably a federal recommendation rather than a state recommendation. Is that, would that be fair to say or am I No, because a lot of it is dictated by insurance market. It's dictated by? The insurance market even under the exchange book. So where certain drugs are acquired by patients is dictated to a level within the insurance market, and that would need to be uplifted in addition to any federal stoppages that, that may exist in the platform. But there is, without question, a hard insurance market, narrow marketing of certain drug classes. You're talking about prior authorization and prior authorizations, um, access, certain <laughs> medications, uh, which they like to call specialty medications, um, have limited restricted networks. They may not be limited distribution drugs. I have full access to some of these drugs, but yet I can't dispense them to patients because I'm not in, I'm not in network to dispense them. So something like that may be of consideration, increasing access. I, uh, you know, one thing that I hear constantly in the news about uh, is this, this massive move, which we're seeing today, about liquidation and move to capitalization for individuals and companies. Um, so perhaps maybe a moratorium on deductibles. 
So that constituents are only paying copays or even bottom tier copays in the interim here, so that uh, their own financial resources are not depleted and miss any potential fall off that may come, so that they can prepare effectively. They can buy other consumables um, as necessary, water, whatever, just toilet paper, which is hard to get to. <laughs> um, and I think the third thing um, that I would suggest uh, in, for consideration would be something um, to protect the healthcare industry. Um, pharmacies, hospitals, physicians' offices, uh, in order for those to work, all require significant infrastructure of staff. Um, in the event of a massive outbreak, if our staff goes down, we cannot continue to service our population. What I think would be, and this is just an idea that popped into my head, is some assistance with small businesses to uh, furlough positions so that we could self-isolate staff members to keep rotating in uh, without any certain, you know, so that they can be compensated for this lack of actual work hours. But we could rotate people in so that in the event that people, uh, there is an outbreak, uh, they're somewhat segregated and can effectively manage with, with minimal staff so that we can continue to service throughout the outbreak. I think I'm kind of explaining that correctly. I don't know. It's just an idea that popped in my head. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not sure I fully follow. So, yeah. Let gonna, me try this again. But I'm but, going to suggest that I'm not going to try to okay. promote, but I'm going to ask you to think about it and yes. try to articulate something um, further for us uh, at a later time. So, uh, those are. I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Um, about the bill, um, so you can find this. So I'm concerned that the language about the interested stakeholders, the board shall appoint interested stakeholders with applicable subject matter expertise is appropriate. Do you think that's clear enough and strong yeah. enough to make sure that it's not, the stakeholders are not? It's Lops. not lopsided, it's not one-sided. No, I think that's sufficient enough. I think one of the things you run into is if it gets, I think the board, I, I have full confidence in the board okay. to, to do that. I, I, I'm not concerned about that. Right. Okay. Right. You think that January 15, 2021 would be a better day than January 15, 2022? Um, Just your opinion. My opinion would be, oh yeah, of course it's better. I mean, the more information that comes, I mean, it may not be the full report. I think an updated report. I I do not think that um, a solid report that's going to give answers, meaningful answers for strong, comprehensive action is going to be ready before 2022. Uh, it's just unrealistic. Um, Quite a few years. I spent too long trying Over to convince years. people about how pharmacy even works. I'm still doing Pharmacy 101. I think Brian Murphy and I think Susan Kowski are still doing Pharmacy 101 discussions here with various committees. Uh, it's a very complicated industry. So uh, I, I think it's unreasonable for a full report to be issued by 2022 with some kind of update periodically or, or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to ask that we, uh, we're going to come back to this once we have, we, we ask for there to be an addition of a uh, check-in with the committee in 2021, and we'll come back to that uh, in terms of having the language in front of the group. Okay. So um, we're going to, I'm going to need to step back and think about how to um, touch base with all of you and to how best to proceed. We have some new uh, challenges on our plate as well as our ongoing work. And um, so I'm just going to ask you to be flexible and stay connected to the, stay connected with Demis and with our emails that will give you an alert. We may choose to be back in here this afternoon. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to be reaching out to the appropriate stakeholders to get further input, to get input in terms of immediate steps uh, that we can take to support Vermonters around issues of home health, mental health, pharmacy, et cetera. And uh, while at the same time trying to move some of our agenda forward. 
Yeah, I was just going to request of members because we couldn't get to the affordability piece um, uh, this morning that to the extent you can um, get the time to read the language and and you know ask questions offline in anticipation of us being able to discuss it at some point, hopefully. But to the extent that can expedite everybody's understanding and you know, you're able to do that. in the interests of uh, everyone's well-being and stop for lunch.